All right, so we are recording. And uh, once again, welcome everybody to our last um, uh, Friends Along the Mullica series tonight. Um, we've had four sessions that all were um, uh, have to do with environmental issues um, around the Mullica River Great Bay estuary. Um, and each one of those sessions focused on, you know, those particular um, environmental topics. And uh, the last one that we are doing is um, on climate change and various um, issues surrounding climate change and um, how it's impacting these towns along the Mullica. So um, before I introduce our speakers, I just wanted to go over a few things. Um, if you can keep yourselves on mute uh, during the program, uh, that would be great. Um, if, if you want to put your camera on, that's completely fine, but that's optional. You can keep yourself um, off screen if you'd like. Um, if you have a question, just put it in the chat. We're going to get to, um, we're going to hear from three speakers and then we'll go to question time. Um, so if you have a question, but want to put it in the chat so you don't forget, uh, that's completely fine. Um, later on, you can um, have the opportunity to also take yourself off mute and ask your question. Um, but we'll review all the questions at the at the end when we hear from everybody. Um, we'll have plenty of time for questions too tonight. Um, and uh, aside from that, if you want to change the view of your screen, you can go up to the little um, top right corner. It looks like a little Rubik's cube. Um, you click on that and you can change to gallery or speaker only, um, whatever you prefer, if you want to see other people or just see the people that are talking. Um, all right. So Steve, do you have um, any uh, anything you want to say about the film, about Go Green Galloway? Um, yes, I... <clears throat> I, first of all, I'm sorry, I, I can't get my uh, video up, but it, the S will have to do there. Um, mm -hmm. I, I want to thank you so much, Caitlin, for your uh, rock solid performance on uh, these four sessions that we've uh, had here. It's been uh, uh, great for you to do this. The multiple speakers have been excellent over the last uh, four months. Um, this climate change discussion, certainly thank uh, Ken, Abel, and Angela Anderson and Vanessa Tropiano for coming on. Um, three of the things that were topmost on my agenda for the movie were uh, climate change, actually number one, uh, biodiversity and, and issues surrounding pollution. So this is very exciting tonight to uh, hear uh, the three of you speak on climate change. I'm really looking forward to it. I just wanted to say that even though this series is ending. The Friends Along the Mullica project is going to continue in various ways uh, to uh, explore and protect and collaborate uh, with new towns and new friends. So uh, please stay in touch with uh, JC Near, uh, Friends Along the Mullica Facebook page. Um, our sponsor team here in Galloway is Go Green Galloway. So uh, please check in with gogreengalloway.org and uh, of course JC Near, uh, jcnerr.org. And um, we'll see you around. I hope we'll uh, get a chance to get some celebrations in. That was part of my plan with the movie was to get everybody together in various places. And uh, I still intend to do that at, uh, from time to time. Uh, we'll have some, some parties along the way. Um, just a little reminder, uh, we'll be tabling with some of our friends at uh, the first annual Stafford Township Green Fair, which is this Friday from 12 to 4 in uh, Manahawkin. So if you get a chance to stop by and say hello, that would be great. So uh, thanks again, Caitlin, and all, everyone for uh, putting this together. Yeah, no problem, Steve. This was a great uh, collaboration. I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it. Um, it was really interesting, really great to tie into the movie too. And you guys are doing great work as well at Go Green Galloway. So um, it was a pleasure to work with you over the last four months. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So we'll get to our speakers. Um, I'll do quick introductions and then um, turn it away to uh, them to um, tell us all about um, the Mullica River. So 
Uh, our first speaker will be Dr. Ken Abel, who is an author and professor emeritus from Rutgers University, uh, Rutgers University's Marine Field Station. Uh, Ken's interests uh, include um, life history and ecology of fishes and their habitats within the Mullica River Great Bay Estuary System. And these interests have extended to the efforts of climate change and sea level rise on these habitats. Um, and then our second speaker is Vanessa Tropiano, who is the JC Muir Coastal Training Program Coordinator. Um, and her work has focused on the response and adaptation to coastal climate change uh, impacts for nearly a decade. Uh, she's been with the JC Muir since 2020 and leads the Coastal Training Program, which focuses on outreach and engagement to coastal decision makers around coastal hazards like sea level rise and storms. Um, she has an undergrad at Rowan and an uh, undergraduate degree at Rowan um, and an MS in interdisciplinary ecology from the University of Florida. And then our last speaker is Angela Anderson, who is a, a sustainability coordinator for the Long Beach Island Township um, and is also the new field station manager um, in Holgate and has been involved in many, many various projects, um, one of them being the oyster recycling program. Um, so welcome everybody. And I will uh, turn it over to Dr. Ken Abel, who's going to kick us off with more of the ecology um, and uh, um, environmental aspects um, related to climate change along the Mullica. So uh, Ken, it is all yours. Thanks, Caitlin. Uh, this slide is to remind me that uh, while I'm talking about climate change, probably what I'm going to focus most on in this short period of time is, is the evidence for sea level rise in the, in the Mullica system. Next slide. And we, uh, this is the only graph I'm going to show you, so you can rest easy. But we are fortunate in that we have strong evidence for um, sea level rise from a tide gauge that's been in Atlantic City since 1912. And this graph shows from the early 1900s to into the 2000s. And on the right axis, it shows sea level rise in feet. So that red variable line uh, is no doubt increasing over time. So that's one take home message. The second take home message is the global average is the green line below it. So the difference is substantial. Uh, the Atlantic City rate of sea level rise is about double the global average. Uh, this has to do with the past effect of glaciers and the withdrawal of groundwater and other things, but those are the two major ones, resulting in subsidence of the land. So not only is sea level rising, but in our part of the world, the land is subsiding. So that accounts for the difference in the sea level rise. So this is a perfect place to try to begin to understand the effects of sea level rise. Next slide. And we use a number of approaches that I'm gonna show you very quickly. We have uh, images from helicopters, we have drone images, we spent a lot of time ground truthing both of those kinds of images with uh, getting in kayaks and understanding the local topography and ecology, as well as using techniques like side scan sonar to look underwater. Next slide. So in this example here, this is uh, marshes near Port Republic, uh, just above the Garden State Parkway Bridge. So you see marsh there and that fringing forest in the center of the upper center of the screen shows a lot of dead trees along the edge. These so-called ghost forests are uh, common and they're becoming more common all the time. We use um, Atlantic white cedar as an indicator because it, it grows up in freshwater bogs. It only can live in freshwater. If it's exposed to salt water, it dies. So the dead trees you see there are the result of sea level rise, salty waters inunda inundating the roots of the tree and killing them. In some instances, it's been demonstrated that as many as, as few as three high tides is enough to kill an Atlantic white cedar. 
So these ghost forests are one kind of evidence of sea level rise in the system. Next slide. Here's even better evidence. This is an image from a helicopter in the upper Mullica. That's the road to the road to uh, Green Bank. And all along the road there in the upper part of, of, the, of the slide, you see that large gray area. This is acres and acres of Atlantic white cedar that died during Hurricane or Superstorm Sandy. So again, it pushed a lot of salt water upstream. This is typically freshwater, pushed a lot of salt water upstream and killed all those Atlantic white cedar. Uh, the frequency of storms is another thing that is being, in, is being influenced by climate change. Next slide. And then if we turn to talk about marshes, it's important to realize the ecological services that are provided by marshes. The marsh in this photo is uh, along the Molokka, and that's the Garden State Parkway Bridge going over the Molokka. So extensive marshes in the system. They do a number of things. They provide habitat. They provide food web support for fishes and crabs and a whole host of other things. They buffer against storm wave damage. They stabilize the shoreline. They enhance water quality. They pr preserve biodiversity. They provide for carbon storage. And there are a whole host of socioeconomic services to humans from, from aesthetics to research to a whole host of things. So it's a long list of, of uh, advantages. And the nice thing is the taxpayers don't have to pay for any of this. Marshes do it by themselves. Next slide. So one of the first things that most people recognize in this is for an area called the Sheepshead Meadows or the Tuckerton uh, Peninsula. Little Egg Inlet is just off the screen at the bottom. So this chart shows the shoreline in 1984 and the red shows the shoreline in 2015. So over a period of 21 years, you can see how much marsh edge has been lost, especially on the left side of the peninsula and at the bottom. So extensive areas of marshes that have disappeared and presumably due to uh, sea, level, sea level rise as a result of climate, climate change. So this is where a lot of people concentrate their efforts is understanding that erosion at the edge, but there are other effects as well. Next slide. So for example, we know that in the interior of the marshes on the peninsula and elsewhere, we're losing a lot of marsh. And again, remember all the advantages of having marsh. We're losing a lot of marsh. And you can see that in a comparison on the Sheepshead Meadows, where things that start out as pond in this 1930 image, this is when Great, when, uh, Great Bay Boulevard was first constructed. You see the road there. You see the road here. But look how much more extensive the, the ponds, and I refer to them as lakes now. They're so extensive are in 2015, that's at point A. At point B, you see the same thing, a 1930 image, but by, by 2015, that has expanded a lot. So again, we're losing marsh on the edge and we're losing marsh on the interior. Thanks, next slide. So what does all that mean? Well, very quickly, if you go to a program like Flood Mapper, it predicts where, where we might be in a few, in, in uh, different levels of sea level rise. So at one foot of sea level rise in the blue here, you see almost all of that peninsula is gonna be underwater all of the time or almost all of the time. The effect is while marsh grasses like to be, like to experience the tide, they can't stand constant flooding, but they're going to be experiencing constant flooding as are areas up in Little Lake Harbor, over here in part of the Forsyth Refuge and on upstream. So we're going to be losing a lot of marsh with one foot of sea level rise. So yet another indicator of the effects of climate change on sea level rise. So I'll be uh, glad to leave it there and uh, look forward to any questions you might have. 
Thank you. All right, thank you, Ken. Uh, Vanessa, I believe you're up next. Oh, you're on mute, uh, Vanessa. Sorry, <laughs> too okay. many windows open. I was struggling to get back to the Zoom screen. All right. <laughs> All good. <laughs> so when we think about impacts of climate change and sea level rise, um, whether they be ecological, like Ken was just talking about, or impacts to the human environment, um, nowadays it goes hand in hand with resilience, coastal resilience. You hear the word all the time. It's quite a buzzword, especially over the past decade. Um, and coastal resilience describes the actions that the government or residents or any stakeholder can take to be prepared for the impacts of sea level rise and other coastal hazards. And the idea is that if we take action now in advance of future risk, um, in advance of sea level rise, you know, Ken's map of the marsh showed one foot, two foot, four foot. If we take action now before we get to four foot and we've lost more marsh than we can ever get back, um, we'll be more prepared and we'll be prepared to both survive those impacts and thrive in the face of climate change. So it's not just bouncing back from climate change impacts, but bouncing forward when we talk about resilience. And community resilience, um, really depends on the resilience of truly the whole community. And that's what this graphic tries to get at. So it's the ecological resilience that Ken was talking about. Um, it's the infra infrastructure resilience, how, infra how ready are our roads and our sewer systems and our electricity grid for climate change. Um, and then the resilience of the other parts of a community. So the businesses and the residents and the municipal structures. And I always say that, I don't know what group it is, maybe the Marines that you're only as strong as your weakest member or something, but I would like to say that you're only as resilient as the least resilient part of your community. One thing I wanna point out is when we talk about um, coastal resilience in New Jersey, we're talking about much more than just the shore. This program, of course, is about um, the Mullica River area, but anywhere that is um, impacted by a tidal waterway in New Jersey is considered coastal New Jersey. And that's what this map shows. All of the dark blue areas are tidally influenced water bodies and the light blue areas are the municipal boundaries. And so all of those blue areas we consider coastal New Jersey. And you can see the Mullica, of course, um, right down there on the bottom right. Coastal areas, of course, are subject to a unique set of climate change hazards and just general coastal, ha coastal hazards. So for example, storm surge, this map shows the extent of the sandy storm surge up the Mullica. And you can see the uh, light blue outline of the river winding its way up and then this darker grayish blue um, shaded area showing the storm surge from Sandy. And so building coastal resilience is really a puzzle of sorts in New Jersey because there's so many different people and places and interests. Um, and the NJ Coast is made of many complementary and diverse and ever-changing parts. And so there's quite a puzzle to put together as we work on these things. One of these ever-changing things is flooding. Um, and this is a photo from Surf City in Long Beach Island in October 2018. I was on my way to work in the morning and I stopped and had to snap a picture of the flooding on the right. And so photos like this beg the question, is flooding getting worse? And the answer is yes, but it's complicated. Sea level is rising. You saw Ken's graph from the Atlantic City tide gauge. Um, and so flood levels and the frequency of flooding is rising in connection with sea level rise. Development is increasing, and so stormwater runoff is getting worse. But then at the same time, communities are making those infrastructure improvements to be more resilient. And so in some places, 
all despite sea level rise and despite climate change, the flooding locally may not be as bad as it was if there's been steps taken to alleviate it. But communicating the science and the risks and the impacts um, is one of those first steps to building resilience. And that's what I do at the JC NEAR. I run the coastal training program and the goal of the program is to provide science and information to coastal stakeholders to help them make decisions. One of the tools we use for that is called New Jersey My Coast. It's a partnership with the New Jersey Coastal Management Program, um, which is administered by the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. And My Coast is used to collect and analyze photos of coastal events and places. The photos are linked to data about weather and tides, and it creates a little report that can help stakeholders both to understand coastal change and even start to make more informed decisions about the changing environment that they live in. So the way my coast works, you add your picture um, in either the app or on the website. It pulls in background data about the weather and the tides, and then it generates a, port, a report that can be used to inform decision-making in coastal areas. This is what the app looks like. If you go to download it, it's one national app. Um, and then it uses the location of your phone wherever you are to load your specific state portal. There are, uh, I think, 10 other states that are also using MyCoast in addition to New Jersey. In New Jersey, we have two different photo collection tools, they call them. One is the high water tool to track flooding. And the other is called Places We Love. And that's for photos of valued coastal places. So in the high water tool, um, if you go onto the website or if you look on it on your phone, you can see a map where all the photos have been taken. Um, and the colors of the numbers just are showing where there's uh, the most photos. So 109 right around uh, our area, because I think as we <laughs> promote my coast from JC Near, it's kind of spreading out around us. Um, and then you can see there are fewer as you move out. Not that flooding is any less of a problem in Cape May. Um, we're just working to getting to getting the new word out about this tool down there and getting folks using it. You also get a stream of all the recent photos. That's what you see on the right. And then if you click on one of the photos, um, you can actually see the report about that photo. And so you'll notice that there's a title overview. It tells you how long it's been um, from high tide at the nearest tide gauge to where that photo was taken. It tells you about the weather so you can compare the rain on that day. Um, and if you are near a river, you can also get river gauge data. And so this really paints a picture of the source of the flooding and the cause of the flooding um, in this nice little report format. One of the things we're really proud of with MyCoast is the ability to view these photos on New Jersey Flood Mapper. There's this button on each of the reports that if you click, brings you over to New Jersey Flood Mapper. Um, and so if you're not familiar with this tool, it was created by JC Near and Rutgers and a bunch of other partners to help visualize flood impacts. And this um, screen just shows you how it looks when you turn on the MyCoast photos you can see them all across the state and it's constantly updating as new photos are added. However, if um, you are to click, if you were to click on this view on flood mapper button, what it would actually bring you to is zoomed in right to where your photo is. And it's kind of hard to see, but there's a little wave icon in the center of that uh, yellow circle. I added the circle so we could see it a little easier. And what I can now do is go ahead and add a flood hazard to the map. In this case, I went over to the flood hazards and I chose just one foot of sea level rise. Um, this is Great Bay Boulevard and this is where the photo was taken. And now you can see that instead of just looking at um, a map with blue on it showing that there's flooding, I have the ability to actually look at that photo and start to get an idea of what flooding really looks like in that area. So I can click on the icon, I see a, I see a flooding photo, um, and in this case, I think that the picture actually shows significantly less flooding than what we see um, with one foot of sea level rise. So probably this wasn't a day when the tide had exceeded one foot above normal. Um, and I think I'm going to wrap it up there, Caitlin. All right. Thank you so much. Those were really great tools. I put links to my coast and New Jersey flood map are also in the chat. So <clears throat> you can... Um, check those out uh, later on if you'd like. Um, 
Angela, you're up next. Uh, okay. Um, oh, Vanessa, you yeah, I can't uh, share the screen yet. Sorry about that. I think you should be good now. <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you it's a. Uh, um, no, I think this is what we were trying to avoid, right? The uh, the awkward know. transition. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. So I'm sorry. So I just have to do the share screen. You can do it if you have it. If it's easier, if we're on a. Um, I do have your PowerPoint. So if you'd like me to. Yeah, it doesn't seem to be clicking on for me. That would be great um, if you have it because it doesn't uh, seem to be clicking for me. Okay, one second. Sorry about that. No, you're fine. That's why we got a backup. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> seriously. So, uh, okay, so I'll, uh, we'll get that uh, together. Um, I'm Angela Anderson, Long Beach Township. Um, I'm here in Hullgate section of our of Long Beach Township, and it's our new facility, the Long Beach Township Marine Education Field Station. You can go to the next slide. Um, so we've been talking about uh, marshes and uh, all that stuff, and I'm going to shift gears a little bit to talk about uh, the Bay Islands, the Bay Marsh Islands. So that's kind of complementing uh, the conversation that. Ken started for us tonight. Uh, this picture kind of shows you uh, all those little tiny words that you can't read in white are a number of the islands that are occurring off of Long Beach Island. Again, I'm down here in the Holgate section, just uh, to the uh, where Little Egg Harbor meets uh, Great Bay, uh, right at the mouth there of the Mullica. So um, when we talk about the Bay Islands, um, you know, we kind of, uh, what I'll lead into is a new program that we're working on about these Bay Islands. You know, what, where are they? How many are there? What is their function? Uh, you know, how have they been, been behaving for the last 30 years? And, and what can we do to look at them? So we really want to start to look at the anatomy of these um, Bay Islands. Uh, next slide. Um, so we created a new, just in case we didn't have enough acronyms, groups, or tools <laughs> to use, we um, formed a group back in 2020, um, sparked by a resident here in Long Beach Township saying, you know, what's up with the Bay Islands? Is it where we, you know, he lives adjacent to a Bay Island and he's seeing it eroding away. He's seeing it affecting the way he's boat. Uh, behaves at his dock and he was asking us what we're doing about that and we said you know um, it is it is a really important uh, thing to do so we said you know we want to start looking at everything in a regional way we're 18 miles here on Long Beach Island we you know we have this beautiful little egg harbor bay and there's so much open uh, marshland there um, and these bay islands are sort of that in between the, the in between Long Beach Island uh, you know and the mainland so what we did is we've got, a, oh gosh, I think there's 40 of us in this initiative now. And what we've done collectively is done an inventory of all of the Bay Islands from uh, Manasquan Inlet to Absecon Inlet. And um, to just get a snapshot based on historical, uh, you know, data, photos, um, and just sort of a collection of, of, of inventory not as far back probably as we should be going, but we just, you know, I think in 77 is when the Tidelands maps were, were done. So in some instances we can go farther back. So starting to get that, um, uh, you know, snapshot of ha how many exist, how many existed, and then get them up on a, a, a data platform. Uh, next slide. So um, what we did is we created the, because we have to get into acronyms, the New Jersey Bay Island Restoration Planner. We call it the NJ Burp, uh, affectionately. And um, I'm not sure, did, did your screen go out on everybody else or is that just- me? Sorry, I pulled something up um, and it, I wasn't expecting it to go on that screen. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, it should be so, fine. Uh, okay, I don't see it, but um, I just see a gray screen, but- Yeah, it's gray now. 
Um, oh, it's still. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, there we go. There go. Yep. So the Bay Island Restoration Planner um, is not live yet. It's sort of in beta form. We're we're trying it out, um, and uh, people um, much much smarter than myself uh, really worked on this data from. Stockton's Coastal Research Center, Monmouth University, the Nature Conservancy, Barnegat Bay Partnership. We have a real collection of, of great minds that started to put this planning tool together. So you could really hone in on each island and you can put in the data layers, very similar to the way we were just looking at some of the other tools where you can do the My Coast or the flood map, or this is the same type of thing. In, you, know, you can really hone down, you can indicate what data you want to look at you what do you want to look at how the edge has been behaving do you want to look at like we were talking about the ponds or the lakes and the the types of things happening there the vegetation the bird activity i mean there was there's i think about 29 or 30 different layers of data to start to look at and um then we can start to prioritize and say which ones have maybe the highest potential for success to either be restored or stabilized and what techniques would be best used based on how that has been behaving over the last you know, three to, to five decades. Uh, next slide. So as we started getting into utilizing this planner, you know, there, there seems to be a, a high abundance of funding out there on coastal resilience, um, coastal infrastructure, and things like that. So as we really started refining this burp uh, within the, the New Jersey Bay Island initiative, um, there's about, like I said, we've got about 40 groups in there now. Um, you know, we started to refine it and um, some funding came available. And we said, as we're going through the beta sort of phase of this, we want to show how we can use this. Let's, let's, let's see if we can't, through the utilization of this, this initiative and um, the planner, um, start to really hone it down. But you can see some of the types of things, those little hash marks on Western Marsh Shelter. Uh, it, it's showing you different um, uh, data points on there. Again, when it's live, I'll give it to everybody and, and, and you can share it. Um, but you can go to the next slide. Um, so we just got some funding. Uh, Long Beach Township applied in conjunction with Stockton and Monmouth and Nature Conservancy. Uh, to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to do uh, restoring Bay Islands off of Long Beach Township. So we, we presented the Bay Island Initiative Coalition of Groups and the BURP in beta form and said that we wanted to, to ground truth this effort for the Bay Islands. And we were overjoyed um, to find them uh, agreeing that this is, this is a great project. It was the first federal grant we have only been in existence for a couple of years as a, as a coalition of groups. And my mayor in Long Beach Township uh, has been leading the way in coastal resilience here since right after Sandy. So we felt it was a appropriate thing for us as a municipality to really spearhead on behalf of the group. And um, so we used the burp to prioritize five islands off of Long Beach Township. Now Long Beach Township, for anyone that's not familiar, um, is, is we run the length, you know, we're 12 non-contiguous miles of the 18 miles of Long Beach Island. So here we are very south down here in Holgate, but we run through pieces of the island all the way up to High Bar Harbor by Barnegat Light. So in using the tool, we were able to identify islands down here in the south midway and on the north end. And we feel this is the most cohesive way to really start to look about regional resilience because the bay islands protect us from you know storm and wave activity um, and it affects everybody uh, collectively and their wetlands right and what a wetland is and that that storm water and that absorption and, and all the functionality of that anatomy of that that wetland that detritus that that high functioning uh, area so uh, we're excited and NIFWIF must be very busy because we have yet to sign the contract, but yet suddenly they say, hey, if you guys are in the pipeline with a grant, um, we have more money. And so we're like, great, do we qualify since we haven't uh, you know, uh, signed our contract yet? And so we, put a, we just put a second pre-proposal in for the implementation. So 
what we have for this first phase of this grant was Stockton's Coastal Research Center will do preliminary assessment utilizing the burp of the five islands and Monmouth University's um, Urban Coast Institute will do uh, a preliminary design, like a 30% design of these five islands utilizing these tools and the team of the coalition of Bay Island. And this second phase we put in for is to take at least the top two into full implementation. And what we did is we looped in our municipal engineers here on Long Beach Island. We all share the same municipal engineer for all of the towns on the island and uh, many of the adjacent mainland towns, Little Lake, uh, Tackerton, um, and uh, Owen and Little represents that. So we thought it was really important that we start to look, get our municipal engineers thinking on this level, um, thinking, you know, off, off uh, island. And um, so we're keeping our fingers crossed on that pre-proposal for that second phase. Um, you can go to the next slide. So um, to shift gears a little bit, so we can go back to all that funding that's available in, in Q&A, but it's really something for communities and agencies and organizations um, municipalities to pay attention to the volume of funding coming down the pike for coastal resilience. Um, I want to shift into some, uh, again, yet another new <laughs> coalition um, is uh, we we're just started establishing the New Jersey Shell Recycling Partnership. And it spawned out of, um, a, you know, smaller recycling of shell programs happening here in Long Beach Township. Uh, launched a shell recycling program in 2017 as a call to action after the Oyster Farmers film debuted. And we were uh, focused on a, a pilot shell recycling program that was happening with Stockton, um, the American Literal Society and Parson Seafood. And um, they were working on the restoration of the Tuckered In Research Reef with and at that time when we were just finishing up our film, Oyster Farmer's film, and I say our, I was the producer um, of that uh, film, but Long Beach Township uh, mayor decided this is something that we really wanna get behind. So we started and partnered with Jetty and the Jetty Rock Foundation to start collecting oyster and clamshells on Long Beach Island uh, to go to the Tuckerton Research Reef. So for the last five years, we've been contributing shell about 6,000 bushels um, and the state uh, shellfish uh, folks down in Cody Creek um, in 2019, they approached our team, Jetty and Stockton and uh, our, myself at Township and said, you know, we want to start collecting shell for our Mullica River lease beds and reefs. So we talked to them about how we established our program and Jetty is sort of our branding arm of, of our shell program. And the state of New Jersey now um, starts, a, Scott Stuber is my contact there. And they started their shell recycling program in Atlantic City and they're collecting shell from two casinos, I think Hard Rock. And I think the Knife and Fork Inn just, just uh, came on board. And so they're specifically taking their shell for the Mullica River uh, leases and, and reefs. And, and we'll expand um, from there. But as we started getting um, you know, more exposure on this and people started really seeing what we were doing, the American Literal Society has a, um, a Shuck It, Don't Chuck It program. We, and then I've had other towns calling me saying, we wanna collect shell because they see how important getting shell back into the water is um, for various reasons, which we'll talk a little bit more about. But we decided we're like, you know, we really got to set some kind of a state policy. We want this to be a Jersey thing, but we want it to be done right. We want it to be done in a uh, correct way. So we all got together. There's about, you know, 10 of us um, that got together to create this new New Jersey Shell Recycling Partnership. You see a lot of this type of thing up and down the coast and other oyster recovery program down, you know, towards the Chesapeake and things like that. So this is a very exciting and um, there's a lot of future growth coming here. You can go to the next slide. So you can see that, you know, getting shell back into our estuaries and, you know, we were talking about, um, you know, the blue carbon and the carbon sequestration of marshes and, and, and getting shell back in there and creating these reefs. 
super important for the resilience uh, efforts to restore these areas, to um, you know, maintain a shoreline stabilization. You can see on the left hand side, uh, an example of how shell could be used in, in shoreline stabilization. There's many other ways that shell is utilized, maybe wave attenuation device a little bit offshore. Um, and then the reef development there because oysters are natural, you know, architects in, in, in the water column of our estuary. So each of the bivalves in our system function a little bit differently. Um, they're happy to grow, of course, on a, on a, um, a mussel or a clamshell or a rock or bulkhead, but in nature, in their life cycle, that is how they grow. They grow on, on the back of their, you know, dead ancestors. So they are architects in that water column. And we want to help the shoreline stabilization of, of some of, say, the natural uh, shellfish that would be growing around a marsh, like the, the ribbed mussel there. So we're really kind of complementing it and utilizing it. And the more shell we can get out of the landfills in New Jersey and back into our bays, the better off that will be. As we're racing sort of against this, this climate and the sea level rise, um, you know, we have to really do a concerted effort. So doing this New Jersey effort towards shell, um, I, we think is in keeping with the strong resilience strides that we're taking as a state and the funding that's coming down federally. You can go to the next slide. So I always, you know, I interface with the public. I've, I've been, uh, you know, working with Long Beach Township as a sustainability coordinator for um, whatever, 12 years or so, but doing this stuff in New Jersey for about 30. And collectively, I think the conversation level of everybody that I'm on the panel with, you know, we could talk for, you know, probably a year straight about this stuff, but it's really the, the power of conversation and the power of, of uh, you know, conservation, right? So there's like kind of a little bit of play on words there, but I just get a chuckle when I looked at, you know, Vanessa's slide, um, you know, people, you're not gonna argue that that street was flooded, right? That's weather. And, but yet when you get this accumulation of weather over time and you call it climate, suddenly everybody wants to, you know, arm wrestle you over it. So um, the more we normalize our conversations about some of these things, um, and, and we get the positive form of this conversation out into the public, but, you know, then, then we're doing something because there just becomes too much of a negative. You can't argue about the weather, but you can argue about climate. But there's so many factors contributing to some of these problems that, you know, we don't want, you know, nobody wants to talk about conserving their energy. They just want to say, you know, we need to build more, you know, uh, you know, energy producing, you know, things. So people are really not taking it to their daily activities. Like, what can I do every day? You know, back in the, you know, was it back in the seventies, I guess it was with Jimmy Carter, you know, and all that, you know, we were like, I can just remember growing up and just, you, you just turn the light out when you left the room, you know, just very basic things that were seem to be kind of getting away with or getting away from, but then we do have the smart houses. And, and so there is, some level of being able to control some of that, that, um, you know, energy use, but power and energy, very, very, you know, um, big piece of the problem. Um, digging in plants and gardens, all this kind of stuff, restoring the edges. This is going to be something that people can do. We know that you, we can plant gardens. We know that we can aerate our soil, um, you know, but how can we start to engage people to restore these edges and really start looking at these edges, whether it is a a, a, a near and on land uh, marsh or a bay island, and that's that's what we're on the on the you know the the tip of, and there's going to be a lot more opportunities for that. And obviously, eating local, reducing waste. The shell recycling program is very much in keeping with New Jersey's food waste reduction efforts. Getting everything that we can out of the landfill. Um, you know that supply chain issue we keep talking about. We can we can. We are the garden state, so we really need to take that seriously and value the, the, the local food that we have, the local farms that we have, the local seafood that we have, and the reduction of waste that, that we've sort of been a leader in. Um, and then just sort of the fun fact that New Jersey is the first state to include climate change in K through 12 curriculum. So that is exciting. That's hope for the future on, on many levels that we've uh, you know made these strides in New Jersey and um, getting to the youth to this is they're gonna they're gonna have climate conversations 
on a regular basis that maybe when they become adults, they won't be as mad at each other about it uh, when they get there. So next slide. And that's it for me. So uh, those are just some ways to follow us. Um, if you go to the LBT field station, I encourage you to go there. We're fairly new. We're down here in Holgate. Please come see us. Sign up for our newsletter. Um, check out the Oyster Farmers film and, um, and follow the shell. That's it. All right. Video's not starting. All right. Well, thanks, Angela. Um, sure. I'm having trouble starting my video. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and thanks for uh, adding in that last slide of uh, important things that people can do and or participate in um, to kind of um, uh, start making making change and making a difference. So, and also the K through 12 curriculum. Um, also. Um, equally excited about that happening in our in our state and lots of other things are going on that are great. So um, I want to uh, kind of switch gears to uh, time for questions. We did want to make time for participants to talk to our panel. Um, I also have a couple of questions um, you know, to kind of uh, stimulate some conversations and get some discussions going if we need to. But um, I do see one question uh, in the chat so far, uh, which is for Ken. Um, so what are you looking on the side scan sonar for effects of climate change? I think on one of the slides you had a picture of side scan sonar. Yeah, side scan sonar is just an acoustic technique that lets you look under water. It's not too much different than a than a fish finder when people are looking for fish habitat or fish. But what we were using it for, and this was particularly in an area up near Hog Islands, near the freshwater saltwater interface. As I said before, Atlantic white cedar are a good indicator species. They only live in freshwater bogs, but we see ghost forests. But even more so, if we look in that instance, it was about 10 or 12 feet of water. We detected all these stumps and timbers underneath. We got a wood sample. We used carbon dating, and we found that those pieces of wood dated back to the fifth century. So to put that in perspective, that's about the same time as the decline of the Roman Empire. So those trees were around back then. They were living in fresh water in a bog right near the surface. Now they're 10 or 12 feet underwater because of sea level rise and it's very salty. So those trees, they're, they're rot resistant, they last forever. And we're using those as an indicator, both as ghost forests and as what I call cedar cemeteries. These are cemeteries of cedars that have been around and tell us that sea level rise has been happening for a long time. Unfortunately, it's been sped up since the industrial revolution. And so those changes are happening much more quickly, but it provides perspective. Mm. If you look a little bit to the past, you can, it helps you understand the future some. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, thank you, Ken. Uh, all right, next question. It looks like a two part question um, from Steve, New Jersey, NJ Burp, by the way, one of the greatest acronyms ever. <laughs> Sounds very <laughs> exciting. Um, Angela, are you able to partner with NJDEP, Fish, uh, and USDFWS to do projects, uh, and then also any Army Corps of Engineers input? Uh, yes, yes, we did the play on words specifically so we could have BURP as the acronym, <laughs> um, and that was because again, we do you got to have a you know something that's catchy and something that people are going to enjoy. Um, to engage them. And yes, to all of that, the coalition of groups on the New Jersey Bay Island Initiative include many divisions within the DEP, US Fish and Wildlife Virginia uh, actually chairs the uh, meetings, uh, Army Corps is on there and different uh, DOT. Uh, so we, we've got an array of people. And um, so we're so new and 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 like I said, Long Beach Township and the, and the few partners just 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 got us started in the spoke 
of the wheel of funding and looking at that. And we look forward to the future of all these agencies and all these groups that are part of the Bay Island Initiative. Again, we're from Manuswan up through Absec and there's a lot of work to be done in, in there. And um, we look forward to all those agencies working together and everybody's coming from a slightly different priority. So I'm coming from a community resilience perspective and someone else is gonna come for a habitat or, or whatever it is. And that's the beauty of it is that we can all, you know, that puzzle that Vanessa was saying that there, there's, there's one, one of the pieces of the puzzle is all these little pieces of the puzzle of everybody's value system coming together for the greater good. And we know that um, it will give it our best effort to get those uh, wet islands can be stabilized. So good question, thank you. All right, thanks, Angela. Um, any other questions in the chat or if anyone wants to come off mute, feel free. Uh, this is Steve again. Uh, I think all three of you come together on that uh, island initiative there with your talks tonight when you, I know Ken, uh, some of the conversations that didn't make it into the movie were about your talks about the edges calving off of islands and things and forming peat reefs and um, the way that that becomes an ecosystem of its own. Uh, I wonder how the protection of island edges will manifest, whether it uses a natural approach or, you know, if it becomes something that's hardened like rocks, like a jetty, or, you know, where you lose some of that natural evolution of things, although the climate change has made things to uh, erode faster than uh, they normally would, I guess. But I guess you're, you're, Angela, you're probably looking more towards the natural approach if possible, right? <laughs> Uh, well, I think that is ideally the case, but I think that's to be seen, um, you know, depends on what, you know, the experts find, you know, as they're looking at how something's behaved and what is, what does make the most sense. Um, yeah, I, I, I looked at some of the things that have been done there to, to really protect Osborne Island, and it seems kind of severe there where they put basically built bulkheads and yeah. <laughs> uh, hardened rock structures, at, yeah. but yet trying to build marsh behind it. Um, I certainly don't think that that's what we want to see everywhere, um, but drastic measures have to be taken in some areas, I guess. So we'll see a, 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 a array of things, I guess, is what you're getting at. Yeah, I think so. All right, thanks, Steve. Uh, any other questions? Well, I think we are coming up on our time here. So actually before, um, I'll, I'll give a little bit of time, um, you know, if you're kind of stewing over something and maybe you want to ask it, um, feel free to put it in the chat. But um, I will take this time to um, let everybody know here that before, um, uh, well, after we leave tonight, you um, will see an email from us um, with other materials from our speakers tonight, um, particularly Ken uh, has some information about um, a book he wrote uh, called Beneath the Surface, and it goes really in depth into the Mullica River system itself. Um, and then also, in addition to that, um, an article about uh, cedar cemeteries. Um, and um, if, uh, if you want as well, I can also put in the other tools and other projects and links that were mentioned tonight uh, in that email as well, such as New Jersey Flood Mapper, MyCoast. Um, also check out MyCoast on your phone um, so you can participate in MyCoast if there's ever a flood event or just put in you know, the places that you love. Um, that's a, a, a really great tool. So um, we will send you all of that um, uh, a little bit later on after the conclusion of this talk. So uh, any final word or final thoughts? Uh, Steve, again, I wonder if Steve Giusecki, can you uh, speak a little bit about your experience on my coast if you're there?
Ah, I am. Uh, yes, I'm here. Uh, I, I don't know what we I've been using it. Uh, um, no, I don't really know what else to say. Okay, what I what I was getting at, I think, is uh, you and I had a discussion about using my coast from some uh, positions that are stationed. Oh, so, oh, this um, maybe Vanessa could talk about that. That the, the uh, stations that um, the the fixed stations that people yes. can hook their camera up to. Yes. Yeah, sure. So they don't exist yet, but um, Steve and I have talked about them and talked about getting one um, in Margate. But in, in the next year or so, over the course of the next year, we're working with our partners at DEP to have some MyCoast photo stations. So the idea would be that, um, you know, maybe there's a spot where there is an area of marsh that's undergoing change and it's it's a publicly accessible location and there'd be a benefit to having many photos over time from the exact same angle to document that change in the shoreline that would be the type of place where we'd have one of these stations where there'd be a sign and um, you know some educational material and and instructions about what to do and the public would put their their phone up on the little photo station post and they take the photo and then in the MyCoast portal, we would have in theory over time, uh, a longitudinal documentation of the change in that location. And it could be marsh, it could be a flooded area that floods often and we wanna see um, pictures of different flood levels. It could be a place where there's a beach that's that's eroding or a dune that's eroding, um, but that's how that'll work. So, so stay tuned. Thank you. Well, that brings up a question, if we can use that, um, put like stations on the deterioration of islands, because here in Margate, uh, by the Margate Bridge, we lost one of those sedge islands, and we watched it disappear over a period of years, and that just created a big mud flat um, up on uh, the other side of the shore, on the bay. Yeah, so if there's a spot where there's a place where you could take a good picture of that area, then then I don't see why not. Yeah, is there a, is there a program to, to monitor some of these sedge islands that are disappearing? Because I see a lot of caving uh, of the of the islands when I go kayaking in the back base. And it very much concerns me. Where you said you're in Margate. I know up here in the Barnegat Bay Partnership has been running the paddle, the edge, uh, paddle for the edge. Uh, it's a sort of a volunteer, you know, science. Um, you know, people get assigned an area and they do that kind of cumulative, you know, capture photos of of a, of a certain marsh area, marsh island um, through the Barnegat Bay Partnership initiative. Martha Maxwell Doyle has been working on that for a long time. I don't know what it, down in your area, but it's certainly something that there's a model for up here in the Barnegat Bay watershed for that. Yeah, it seems like a very good program. I because I, I I see a lot that's going on at Bar Barnegat, but I don't see too much observations going on from like Cape May on up to say Atlantic City. Now's your opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'd like to go out with. I'd like to go out on that and check check it out. <laughs> All right. Anything else before we conclude tonight? When I did just want to I did just want to say something. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, the the first slide can put up, you know, and that was based from the Atlantic City tide gauge that had been there uh, for a very long time. One of the things in that, that NIFWIF grant we just got was to install a tide gauge uh, right off of the field station in Holgate. And, um, you know, research is telling us that there was historically one very near the location um, where the field station is, was Bowie 77 Marina and, and a couple other things. Uh, so we're looking at the historical context of where tide gauges have been, where they are currently, where we're getting data. If we put this new one in, that would be funded through this grant um, and the network to get into that um, 
all along the coast. So that is a piece of that grant too. So we look forward to getting some of that new equipment um, to, to tack on to some of that historical trending data. Cool, great, and that's good news. Thanks, Angela. Angela, the US Geological Survey, which, which uh, maintains ours in our boat basin at the station, uh, is, is a good contact for that. Okay. They, they run all the federal ones that are located in New Jersey. So if you could plug oh. in their, their system, that would be ideal. Fantastic, thank you. All right, everyone. Uh, well, I want to thank you for coming out tonight. Um, and also want to thank our speakers for taking the time to um, chat with us about these important issues um, and important things that are being done um, in, re in response to climate change. So um, bravo, thank you so much. <laughs> Give you a round of applause. Um, and uh, keep an eye out everyone for that email that has some extra info and um, you know reminders of what we discussed tonight and feel free to contact uh, the panel myself um, if you have any other questions so um, with that I'll let everyone go tonight hope you have a good evening thank you thank you yeah, thanks Caitlin thank you yep. thank bye bye you. bye